Hello, welcome back to our machine learning course. Now in the previous video, we gave an introduction to how to do a text analysis using nomads. And we saw a simple way to represent text using the back of words representation. In this video, we'll talk about a much more powerful way to represent words uh, using word embeddings. A word embedding uh, maps each word to an n-dimensional space. So every word becomes a point in the space, like the word movie or the word cat. And they end up all in different parts of the space. And we hope to train um, or to, have to find an embedding so that similar words are close together in that space, or that the space captures something meaningful about the semantics of the words in question. Typically, this space is about uh, 100, maybe 300, maybe 500 dimensions. Right? So that's much, much lower than the 10,000, 20,000 dimensions that we used when we represent uh, words as mega words. Right? So it's a much more smaller and hopefully more meaningful way of um, representing text. Uh, there's two main ways of finding this embedding. The first way is to learn the embedding with the task. So there we have some input text. We then give this to what's called an embedding layer. And this embedding layer has a set of weights. It basically has to learn for every possible input word a 300 dimensional or depending on how much you have embedding uh, for each word. So if the word cat comes in, uh, this is basically uh, shown as an ID, ID for the word cat, um, then the embedding layer will output a three-dimensional representation for that word. And then we give that to some other layers, and at the end we have an output. And then we can train this embedding so first of all, we randomize it. So we initially, we initialize randomly, and then we, we pass that to the network, we look at the output, we compute the loss, we backpropagate, we update all the weights of this embedding, and then we have learned this embedding. Another thing you can do is to use a pre-trained embedding. This is especially useful whenever you don't have a lot of data. So if you can't learn this embedding from scratch, you can use embedding that was trained beforehand. Right? So there are um, large embeddings which were learned, for instance, on Wiki all of Wikipedia, or all of Google News. And so we'll see how, how they did that. And we can basically just import this embedding and you've seen before uh, using images. So you can learn an embedding uh, trained on ImageNet and then use that using transfer learning. Uh, for another task for if you don't have so much image data, or not so much labels, we can use that. And then again, we can choose whether we just freeze these embedding weights and use the exact same embeddings as the previous tasks, which works quite well actually. Um, or um, if our new task is quite different, uh, say if it's not classification, it's something quite different, uh, we may want to unfreeze uh, these embedding weights and fine tune them to a new task. Okay, first let's discuss what happens if you train your own embedding. Okay. Right, so the first thing we need to do is to have a fixed length for our documents, right? Because our input layer needs to be a fixed size. And so the way we typically do this is we define a maximum length, for instance, 100 words, uh, which means our input layer here will have 100 input nodes. So every document is represented as 100 word IDs, like word number 50, word number 70, word number 102. Um, so these are the words occurring in documents. Um, if your document is large than 100, then we just stop. We just cut off every every word beyond uh, the 100th word. Uh, if your document has fewer than 100 um, words, then we just bet it with zeros until the end. Okay. That's the first step. Um, so now we end up with uh, 100 numbers being fed into our network. 
Then we add an embedding layer, which is exactly just a layer, but it will do something clever internally. So what this does, it, it will map, first of all, every word to a word of encoding, <clears throat> say uh, 10,000 values. This means that, okay, the word 50 will have like a one at position 50 and zeros everywhere else. Okay, the word 70 will have it one somewhere else. Uh, and then you choose uh, the size of your embedding. Um, so say you want a 300 uh, dimensional embedding. So this, this end could be like 10,000. And we choose an n dimensional embedding, say 300. So the output here will have 300 values. Uh, and then basically everything in between are densely connected weights. So what you do, what, when you talk about training and embedding, it means training these weights so that the word um, is mapped to something. So if you would look at this individual word here, it means we learn the weights so that this one word uh, representation of that in 300 values is the 300 weights that we learn uh, after training. Okay. So we learn how to represent every individual word. Uh, so this ends up being a weight matrix, which is n times uh, m, like 10,000 times 300. So in this case, we'll have to learn about 3 million weights. Okay. Uh, and then there's no activation function. So it's called a linear layer. Right? There's no activation function. So the output is exactly uh, this weight matrix uh, times the original input vector. Okay. And this will be our 300 dimensional embedding. And this basically ends up being a lookup, right? So um, this is this weight matrix is a matrix of uh, say ten thousand times three hundred. And so, if you have a word, word number fifty, then we can find the embedding of that word at the fiftieth position in this matrix. Okay, so that's nice. So we can represent uh, the entire embedding as a matrix, which also means that if we learn this embedding in another task, we can just, so say we have another task and we learn the embedding there, uh, we can just copy paste these weights into our new embedding layer, and then we have a pre-trained embedding. So instead of learning a new embedding on a new task, we can take an embedding that was previously trained on another task and transfer it to a new task. Now, typically we want an embedding that was trained on a lot of data, like all of Wikipedia or, or all of Google News. The problem is, of course, that um, to find these embeddings, you would need a lot of labels, which are not available. Now the solution in the, the method that we will discuss is to not learn a classification task per se, but learn the embedding on an auxiliary task that does not require labels. Right? So for instance, if we take some part of the text, such as the cat sat blank, then your model has to predict that the next word, for instance, could be on. Or you have the word cat, and then your model sees the blank set on, you'd have to infer that the missing word would be cat. Okay. And so this allows you to have almost infinite training data. Okay. Uh, this is called self-supervised learning because supervision is provided by the data itself. Nobody needs to label any data. Okay. Self-supervised learning is a very uh, interesting uh, research area. And all the models that we will discuss 
and we're about to do this before this channel is even done. So in the remainder of this video, we'll cover a few ways that we can do this. The first one, very well known, is probably word to back. In this case, we do exactly like we proposed before. We have a sentence like, the cat sat on the mat, and we hide the word cat, for instance, and we ask the model to predict the word that's missing. Um, we use a very simple one layer neural net for that, and afterwards, as it's trained, we use the weights of that network as the embedding for every word, for instance, the word cat. GLOB is a very different model, so in this case, we build a large matrix uh, where we keep track of which words uh, co occur with other words, like cat and sat uh, occur in the same context, so we count how many times it happens, and then we build this whole matrix for all possible words, and then we decompose that into two smaller matrices of a limited dimension k, or rank k, and after we've learned that, we've actually learned the embedding. And so we can look at this position here, and this part will be uh, an embedding for the word cat that we can then use. Fast text is similar to word to vec, uh, but it works in n grams instead. So we don't learn um, an, uh, an embedding for the word cat, but we learn embedding for, for instance, cat and at and so on. So small parts of words so that we can afterwards uh, combine them. Uh, so after we've learned embedding for all these n grams, we can then combine them. And that way we can also produce embeddings for new words that we've never seen before. And then finally, we have language models. Uh, these are very well-known state-of-the-art models, stuff like BERT, Ilmor, and GPT-3. They're very, very expensive to train. They cost millions and millions of uh, dollars. And uh, the nice thing is that they can learn a context-dependent embedding. So while all of these guys uh, always give you the same embedding for the word cat, uh, in language models, it may actually depend on the context that the word is used in. And in one sentence, you may get a different encoding for the word cat than in another sentence. The first way we can learn an embedding using self-supervised learning is called word to vec The principal idea is to solve this auxiliary task, which is to predict from a context which word is missing in the middle. Right? So you give strings like uh, words like like playing blank with my, and you have to predict the word football. Okay. Uh, this task is called CBAO, or Continuous Bag of Words. The way to solve this is by taking uh, the context words, you represent them using uh, another uh, embedding, like a 100 coded embedding. This will give you factors of about 10,000 values, for instance. Uh, and so every, every time this is a word like, this is a word playing. And we have with and we have against my. And then from these inputs, we have to take the output football. Right. So each of these factors is this is a 10,000 dimensional embedding. Uh, one is encoded, so one value will be one and the others will be zero. Same here, the output will be one value, which is one, corresponding to football, and the other ones will be zero. In the middle, you put an n-dimensional hidden layer, n being the number of dimensions you want for your embedding. So if you want a 300-dimensional embedding, this layer will have 300 nodes. Okay? Uh, and then you, you train this network, right? So you, f you, you run this window, in this case we have a window of five. We run this window over all of your text every time you have a new center word and you feed that to your network. Uh, at the end, well, you randomly initialize, you get some predictions, 
you can be lost, you can probably get lost, you update all your weights. And that way you learn your your weights by just using your text. That's pretty cool. Now, after you've learned all of this, uh, if you would look at the output for football here, this output is influenced by all the weights that go from the hidden layer to the upper layer. And this will be 300 weights. And these 300 weights are your embedding. So if you would look at this entire matrix, so this, uh, this weight matrix uh, links a 300 dimensional vector to a 10,000 dimensional vector. Right? So if you draw the weight matrix, it should be something like this. So it has 10,000 rows and 300 columns. And corresponding to every value, so if, the, if football is on index 80, then on index 80 here we'll have the embedding for football. So this row here contains all the weights that influence the app for football. Right? And so after we've learned that, we've learned this embedding matrix and we have learned the embedding. And we're done. Now, Skipgram works in the exact opposite way. In this case, our input is our center word, this is football, and we have to predict the context words, like playing with my. And so it's completely analogous otherwise. So again, we have uh, our inputs are 10,000 dimensional 100 coded vectors. We have a hidden layer, which you can. Now what you would hope to expect at the minimal from an embedding is that similar words will be close together, right? Like, um, I'm not sure, the word red and orange maybe should be relatively close together because they're related, right? Um, interestingly, they saw that Except from that, the word effect also happens to learn very interesting relationships between the words. For instance, if you take the word king and you look at the vector from the word king to the word queen, and you would take that vector and you translate it to the word man, then that would, that would bring you to a coordinate which is close to the word woman. Okay. So actually, as some of these or combinations of these uh, dimensions correspond to interesting relationship between the words. You can even do simple arithmetic, and it's very interesting. So if you would take the vector for the word king, right, the vector for the word king, and you subtract the vector for the word man, and you add the vector for the word woman, and you add these together, so you do this, you subtract man and you add woman this would bring you two coordinates which are very clear um relationships between words and tenses like walking can be not to walked or swimming to swim from um, current to past tense uh, if you would uh, learn a pca embedding like a 2d embedding a pca uh, you would see that in, in the first principle component, uh, it would map countries to capitals. So that almost, it's almost a horizontal line from Spain to Madrid, or Italy to Rome, or Germany to Berlin. So again, we this is learned basically while learning embedding. It's not designed to, to do that, but it's a side effect of learning this embedding which means the embedding actually maps some interesting properties of the semantics of these words. Now be very careful because it has been shown time and time again, it's a very interesting paper behind this link by the way, if you click that, um, that these embeddings can capture gender biases or race biases or other biases present in your data. For instance, um, so this one paper for instance gives you an example, like if you go from man to programmer, so 
sorry, and you take the word woman, and you take the same vector, it will bring you near the word homemaker, which is, of course, not good. Um, it's not that the model is wrong. In lear it, it learned what the data kind of contained, right? So because the data is biased, the model itself and the embeddings are also biased. Right? So we need a way to either remove biases from the data or learn embeddings in such a way that these biases are not represented in the embeddings. That's a very important and largely unsolved problem. Uh, that the approach uh, is fast text. And this solves two main limitations of WordFAC. First of all, WordFAC cannot represent out of vocabulary words. Like I said before, if you have a word like Tiffany's, which may not have occurred uh, in your original training set, then WordFAC doesn't have an embedding for this word. And it would just give you an error or give you a blank. You just have to ignore that word because it cannot be represented with an embedding. Also, words like meet and meeting, it would it will learn two different embeddings for these words, which is fine. But it, it learned these, it learns these independently from each other. Right? It doesn't share any weights uh, between them. So and that that signals that um, there's something better you could do here. So what fast text does is basically the same ID. It uses skip gram or continuous back of words. But instead of words, it uses character anagrams. So remember before we had a sentence like, I like playing football. Before we would actually um, enter the word football in our um, input layers here, or output layers. In this case, if you see above, it's the output layer. Um, so football here and light thing there. Instead, what you do in false text is you represent the word football. This is by all the engrams from length three to six, right? So three grams means uh, dash foo, foo, oud, oudb, and so on, right? And after you've done that, you learn an embedding for each anagram. Right? So if you, for instance, use, let's use skip gram, it's easier to draw. Um, so if you have the word foo, you would learn an embedding from foo to the context that it appears in. And so you learn an embedding for each possible tree gram. Now, because there's so many possible anagrams, you use hashing, um, so you, you choose a sort of bin size. I think in most implementations of fast text, this is, uh, I think, I don't remember if it's, it's a million or a billion, but it's, it's a very large um, bin size, so collisions are very unlikely, but you still have a limited number of things to store into memory. It's a very large uh, division LTV. Um, possible uh, tree grams that you consider. And so after you've learned um, uh, an embedding for each possible n-gram, you can now represent new words. So for instance, the word football. If you want to represent the word football, you would lit up all the embeddings for all the different tree grams, or four grams, or five grams, and you sum all of these up, right? So you have the embedding for foo, the embedding for foo, and you basically sum all of them up until you end up with your final embedding, and that's the embedding for the word football. You can represent any word. You can you can produce an embedding for every possible word. Another, another thing you do is you don't only train with positive examples like in context words, like in this case, football. Context words would be words like um, playing with my and so on. Right? Uh, these are in context words. There may be uh, 
other words which are completely out of context, like orange or red or blue, maybe uh, these, these words typically don't occur in the same context, or rocket ship or I don't know, hunger. But, so these typically don't occur. So what you do, you randomly sample some negative examples. You learn the distribution over this space of words and you sample where it's, it's very unlikely uh, that this word ever occurred in the context of the word football. And you use these as negative examples. Uh, and to, you can also do this for normal word effect, by the way. Right, so it's it's a way to, to train better. Because next to all of the embedding words, you also can use a lot of negative examples as well. Okay, now we arrive at GLOF, or the Global Vector Model, which is probably one of the most commonly used ones. Um, so what GLOF does, uh, different from WordVec and FastText, is that it doesn't just look at the local context of Word, but it builds a matrix which encapsulates how all the words co-occur together across all uh, bits of text. Um, so let's dive into this. First of all, it starts by building a co-occurrence matrix X, which is shown here. Right? So if we have a few sentences, like, I like playing pool with my friends, this is the tallest tree I've ever seen, and I have trained my dog well, then uh, you build one co-occurrence matrix where you count which words occur together uh, how many times. So for these three sentences, this would be uh, mostly zeros, and all the words occur uh, in every row and every column. Right? So if you have 10,000 words, this is a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix. Here I just highlight a few uh, rows. So the row for football would have a one with the column my, because football and my occur at least once in the same context. The word dog, on the other hand, occurs once with my, my dog, and also trained, trained dog. And the word my occurs with football, football my, and with dog, my dog. So this builds a global matrix of how all words co-occur together. Now, in actuality, these will be counts, right? So it will actually count how many times dog is in the same context as my. And in the actual implementation, they even, um, like, I think they give like a one if it's the next word, and like a 0 0.5 if it's once removed. Um, and yeah, that way the, the, this uh, matrix is filled in. Okay. Uh, and then you take the log of these values because, well, these if you if you use count data, the log typically uh, is a useful way because some words will be super high, uh, super common, and you want to reduce them a bit. So you take the log of x. Okay, and the basic idea is now that you learn uh, a matrix decomposition. Uh, so you represent this large matrix with the product of two matrices. Uh, so say you have 20,000 words. This is a 20,000 by 20,000 matrix. And you represent that by the 20,000 times K matrix, K being the size of your embedding, for instance, 300, times 300 a matrix which is 300 by 20,000. Okay. And so if you would multiply those two matrix, you hopefully end up with this matrix again. Now, um, they solve this using gradient descent. They use Adagrad for this. And so you would represent this decomposition as the product of the two matrices uh, plus the biases. And these two matrices, W and W prime, they are basically the same. So they 
they are initialized randomly, each of them differently. So initially, the initial randomization will be different. So they end up with different uh, random small numbers in the beginning. Uh, but after uh, training, these will be very similar to each other. And it doesn't matter which one you use. Right? So you can, you can choose to use this matrix as the embedding, or you can choose this one. It doesn't matter so much. Uh, so and, and then you can, then you have learned the embedding, right? So now you have a word like football, right? So you hear the word football, then in this, the row that corresponds to the word football will have your 300 dimensional embedding for the word football. And like I said, this is this so this is solved by gradient descent, and your loss function is exactly what I just explained. So it's the the product. So every um, value in this matrix. Um, so the log of xi, xij, so row i, column j, this value here should correspond to the product of i vector times j, i this vector times j this vector, which is number, plus the bias of i plus the bias of j. Um, and this should hopefully be very close to the original value in the matrix. Right? And you take the square um, of the residual. Right? So, hopefully, so if, if you learn a good embedding, then uh, this will be close to zero and your loss will be, not, will be very small. Uh, there's this other tiny bit. Uh, they add this scaling factor. Uh, and this is basically to downweight very infrequent uh, words. So the function looks like this. So it's an exponential up to some value, like 100. I think it's 100 in the paper. Uh, and after that, it's 1. So if you're if the value of if if your word co if your word i co occurs with the word j at least a hundred times, this will simply be one. If this co occurrence is very rare, this is like down weighted with this function, so it counts less in the loss function. It's just it's just a simple way to um, make sure that the loss doesn't overemphasize words that co-occur very rarely right so you want to focus the loss on words words with which co-occur frequently okay. but that's the basic idea right? so you learn this co-occurrence matrix you learn the decomposition and when you've done that you have your embedding and you're done it's a very elegant idea and this is like i said this is one of the most commonly used um, ways to represent to learn embeddings you can download uh, cloth embeddings, which have been pre-trained on Wikipedia or even larger copula, and just use them. Okay, so now we've seen most of the typical word embeddings. Now you may wonder, can we also represent documents? For instance, if you want to show that, for instance, this tweet is similar to that tweet, can we also um, use embeddings for that? So yes, uh, the simplest way of doing that is just to take the sum of all the word embeddings, right? Or the average. This is done all the time. So if you have, for instance, a tweet, you have tweet number one, you have tweet number two, uh, you take all the words in your tweet, you compute the, the, the embedding vectors, and you add up the sum of all the, the embedding vectors, and this gives you a new vector which represents your entire tweet basically. Okay. Um, and then you have you do the same thing for another tweet. You have a different vector, and then you the distance here will give you the similarity of your two tweets. That's the simplest approach. Uh, there's a, a clever algorithm, it's called Dr. Uh, it's, just, it's it's in the same paper as Dr. Um, it's very clever, it's a bit tricky to learn, uh, to train, 
And that's why it's simply used a bit less than simply using uh, some of the vectors, the word vectors. So Dr. Vec works by simply adding uh, the paragraph ID as not input. Right? So say we have, uh, so again, we take, um, we move a window over text, we take the words that occur here. So in this case, we have the cat set on. So we want to put on based on the cat set, for instance. And uh, instead of doing just, so this would be normal um, skip gram. Right? And instead of doing that, we add another input, which is a paragraph ID or the document ID or the tweet ID. And then you, you represent this also as, uh, yeah, one, one, one of the encoded vector. And here you have the, yeah, the concatenation of all these words. And then you learn uh, the embedding. That's not true. Ah, let's start again. Okay, so we've now seen different ways to embed words. We've seen word effect, we've seen glove, we've seen fast text. Now you may wonder, how do we represent entire documents? For instance, if I want to compare two tweets together, um, how can I use embeddings for that? Can I learn an embedding for an entire document? Um, so yeah, uh, the simplest way of doing that is to simply add up all the word vectors. So say you have a tweet, um, which has different words. And so you take the, the vector for the first word, the embedding or the vector for the first word, and you add the second word, the third word, the fourth word, the fifth word, the sixth word. And so after you add up all these word vectors, you end up with your final vector, and that's your representation for the entire tweet, for the entire document. Uh, and you can do it for another document and you end up somewhere here, for instance. And then this gives you a measure of similarity between the two tweets. That's the simplest way. So you can add them together. I think that's most commonly used. You can also average, just take like the average of all the all the factors instead. There's a clever way uh, called Dr. Vec. And Dr. Vec were exactly the same as we saw before with uh, Word Vec except that we add an extra input. So say before we had a context, for instance, the cat sat, and then you want to predict on as the next word. Uh, and you, you could do this normally with, um, with CBAM, okay? Instead of that, you add another input, which is the ID of document or the paragraph. This could be, for instance, the tweet ID. And then while you learn the embeddings for all the words, you also learn an embedding for the paragraphs or the documents. And then you're done. And then you've, you've learned, so after you've trained on all the strings inside the document, uh, you've also learned an embedding for the document itself. Okay. And you, you can totally use this to, uh, to determine like how similar the documents are. It is a bit tricky to train correctly. Um, so that's why Doctivac is not used that often anymore. People typically try to do something simple like the summary average, or nowadays um, you can also look at language models instead, which gives you better predictions, even though they're uh, much more expensive to get. Okay, so now we've learned uh, all these word embeddings. Now, how can we use them? All right, so say that we have uh, some input and we have an embedding layer and the embedding layer outputs uh, a tensor, which is the number of samples in your data set, number of samples number of uh, documents, basically, the number of tweets, whatever. And <clears throat> for every word in document, so let's say you have 100 words in documents, and you have 300 
a dimensional embedding for each word. Right. So yeah, as you train your embedding, you get this out. What do you do with this? Because you still have to um, to either learn this or to use this in some way. So the simplest thing you can do is to flatten this tensor, which will give you um, 300 times 100, just um, 30,000 um, dimensional uh, vector, and again, number of samples. This is a flattened representation of your words, and you can then feed this to some other layers. So the simplest thing to do is just to have the output layer here already. And then you only need to learn basically these weights between your embedding and uh, the, uh, the output layer. And then if you've learned these weights, you've learned your task and you're done. And this directly learns the relationship between your embeddings and your outputs. The downside is that, well, these words came into a certain order, right? These words came into an order. Uh, and by concatenating them, you kind of destroy this order. So yeah, you can do this, but you can flatten um, your embedding and just use it, give it to your next layers, but this will um, destroy the order. So you, you can only learn so much. Another thing you can do uh, is to use a recurrent neural net. In that case, you will give your embeddings, that is 300 dimensional embeddings, one by one to a current neural net. Right? So we haven't covered neural nets so much yet, um, but yeah, these are networks that you feed in. Um, these uh, embedded words one by one, and because they have, uh, because the outputs feed back into the the nodes, they have some kind of memory, and so they can use the exact sequence of words as they occur in the text. Right? And that way, you can actually you can you can learn, you can use a sequence of the words to solve more complex tasks. The downside is, of course, this can be. Or it ends up quite slow to train. Uh, so um, you need a lot of data, a lot of time to do this. Another approach is called a 1D convolutional network. So we've seen 2D convolutional networks uh, or 2D filters, right? So for learning images, you can do the same thing um, for text. So if your uh, different words these are all different words in 300 dimensions, right? You could basically run a window over the sequence of words, just like we did with a filter. So remember we had an image, we had the filter patch, and we kind of moved that over our entire image. Right? In this case, this was a 2D. In this case, we're doing a 1D. Right, so we move this window over the sequence of the words in the document, and this gives us a new output that we can use. And so you can learn, this is, again, this has some weights. This is like a filter, like a 1D filter, and you learn the weights to this output. And so you can, you can learn to recognize patterns. Um, and so, you, yeah, we'll go back to this in a minute, um, but you can do this. And this is often competitive with RNNs, for most simple tasks, right? If you do classification, forecasting, uh, one decolution that tends to be as good as RNNs, and they're much easier and faster to use and to train. So, yeah. Uh, if you have much more difficult tasks, you can use RNNs, or you can, you can use combinations of one decolution that works in RNNs. But for most classification tasks, you can just use one decolution that so just to highlight this a bit more, um, again, like I said, we have our inputs, which will have, which is be here, 300 dimensional inputs. 
Um, you move a window over this. This is window of size 5. You extract this patch. You learn the filter. And then this gives you the output. Right? And you move this window over text to give you the output. And then you, this output then goes to your next layer. Right? So you typically end up with the input. You have an embedding layer. Then you can add like a 1D convolution. You can do pooling. So then you can you can use max pooling to so exactly match, max pooling is exactly the same as before. So you take uh, a number of uh, vectors and you take the maximum of all the values in there, and that's your output. Uh, so you can do pooling, and then you can choose maybe you do another one deconvolution, another pooling layer, and so on. And typically, at the end, you want to have like a dense layer and then output layer. And that way you can um, learn quite deep uh, neural nets for hand handling text data all using this embedded as input. All right, that's it for now. Uh, in the next video, we'll show some more real-world examples and how to solve them in practice.